Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Ethics and Organization Symposium, the first of what we hope to be, that becomes a, at least a biannual event. It's the, um, this event uh, represents a collaboration with the University of Northern Iowa, uh, Allen College, Hawkeye Community College, and the Cedar Valley Character Counts Committee. It started with an emailed idea, which was followed by more emails, which was followed by a few meetings, which was followed by a lot more emails and a lot more meetings, and a lot of time in planning and organizing resulting in this event today that I think you'll find uniquely interesting and informative. Just as planning and preparation has been interesting and informative for me. The planning committee is listed in your program, and we've also got parts on the ribbon that say planning committee. Be sure you show your appreciation of them, and if they're in the crowd, I know they're scattered around, we've got some on campus, we might have some at some of the other locations here, but I, and there might be some out in the lobby still helping people get in, but uh, they're listed on the back of, your, uh, of the program you got, and uh, could I have them stand down and be recognized so we can show your appreciation to this group of folks who spent a lot of time. And of course, something like this wouldn't come down if it wasn't for some sponsors, some sponsors that could help with, with uh, in-kind donations, in-kind uh, supplies, and of course, uh, cash is always nice for some of the expenses we've got. And they're also listed on your program, Allen College, and if a representative from one of the, sp from the sponsors is in, in the auditorium, could you stand and be recognized here, and we'll, recognize, we'll uh, show, our to them when we're, show our appreciation to them at the end. Allen College, I think Jerry's here, uh, the UNI Office of the President, yeah, that'd, be, that'd be him. The John Papa John Entrepreneurial Center. The Waterloo, Catherine in the back, thank you for all you did here, Catherine. The Waterloo Cedar Falls Courier. The Cedar Falls Chapter of um, Institute of Management Accountants. Character Counts, that'd be myself and Nancy that was helping you, and Uenta and uh, Barb that had to leave here. Uh, Hawkeye Community College. The UNI Office of the Provost. The UNI College of Business Administration. Uh, Cedar Valley Nonprofit Association, Sheila's sitting over here, thank you for your help. Target Corporation is in the back, we're gonna hear from those folks. Uh, the UNI College of Humanities, Arts, and Sciences. The UNI College of Social Behavior Sciences. And the UNI Office of Research and Sponsored Programs. Anita in the back there, thank you for all you did, and she's been a spearhead in this thing, so thank you very much. Now, for those people needing continuing education credit or class credits for this uh, session, there's a sign-in table back by near where you registered, and uh, you can get your certificates. Will be the certificates will be mailed to you uh, at completion after a few days after the event. Be sure and use the evaluation form that's in your packet of information to give us some feedback for what we want to do down the road with this. And boxes for the completed evaluations will be on the table where you registered or at the back of the, in the auditorium here somewhere. There's a slight change in the agenda. I don't think you'll notice too much of a difference there. We're gonna, we had to make a change with uh, the Creamery Theater comments and the show must go on, so they're gonna be here, but in a little different form. So we'll be moving right from the second session this morning into their, into their comments. And that should be the changes you need for the housekeeping, I guess, okay. Over the last eight years, uh, the Cedar Valley has had citizens and organizations and students and businesses received statewide recognition from Iowa Character Counts. In 2009, the Cedar Valley was recognized as a community with character. Well, this year was no exception. Last August at the 2013 Iowa Character Awards dinner, someone who prowls around here, right here on the UNI campus, received a very special award. <laughs> So let's get this off to a roaring start and recognize the, this year's mascot with character winner, T.C. the Cat. <laughs> now, fans, and, fans, are friends, fans from everywhere are friends with T.C. Even some of those that, of us that maybe went to another university and maybe sometimes cheer for the other team, but we, <laughs> we still love you and we still get along, don't we? Uh, he's an excellent role model of the six pillars of character for all of us. His actions uh, at sporting events demonstrate that he believes in pursuing victory with honor. And uh, his presence at various functions across the community shows that he's a caring, trustworthy, 
responsible, good citizen. So TC reminds us all that character counts for everyone all the time. So thank you and congratulations, TC. Now, TC, let's, uh, let's turn this over to uh, Executive Vice President and Provost of the University of, Iowa, of, the University of Northern Iowa, <laughs> Gloria Gibson. I'm reading too fast, aren't I? <laughs> Who will introduce uh, a Northern Iowa, right? <laughs> you know, that was a totally unintentional mistake there. <laughs> Gloria Gibson was named uh, Executive Vice President and Provost of the University of Northern Iowa effective in July, and she is going to introduce us to another one of you and I's top cats, Gloria. Oh. Good morning, everyone. It's my honor to uh, introduce our first speaker for um, the session this morning, our president, William Rood. Um, Bill began serving as the 10th president of the University of Northern Iowa in May of this year, and if any of you had the opportunity to attend the installation, two weeks ago, a week ago, two weeks ago, it was absolutely marvelous. Lots of pomp and circumstance. It was uh, absolutely beautiful. Listening and learning were integral to his start at UNI as he focused on building relationships with faculty, staff, and students, alumni, and numerous community and state leaders. He engaged with the campus and community to determine the priorities of increasing student enrollment converting state appropriations to permanent base funding, and continuing UNI's fundraising efforts. President Rood is a member of the Greater Cedar Valence Alliance Executive Board, a regional economic community development corporation, a member of the Governor's STEM Advisory Council Executive Committee, a statewide initiative aimed at increasing students' interest and achievement in STEM subjects and recruiting and retaining STEM teachers. Dr. Rood is a member of the Iowa Business Council, a nonpartisan, nonprofit statewide organization leading efforts in technology innovation and enhancing Iowa's commercial infrastructure. Nationally, President Rood is Iowa's representative to the American Association of State Colleges and University Organizations, whose members share a dedication to research and creativity to advance higher education. Since his arrival, he hit the ground running, rolled up his sleeves, uh, and is getting all of us on our toes uh, to make UNI a better institution. Let us welcome 10th President of UNI, President Bill Rood. Thanks, everybody. Uh, welcome, and thank you for taking uh, time out of your busy Friday to join us for such an important symposium on so, such an important, important set of issues. Uh, I've always promised, for, I, I told the people I wanted to wander around, and they got cameras on me, and so they won't let me. Um, so I'm going to be stiff here at this, uh, the podium, but I'm going to uh, try and get engaged. I'll start off by, uh, I always like to start off anything that I do and talk about by giving you at least a little story so that you can take that home with you and, and maybe tell it to others. And in this case, it has a story I'm going to tell has a interesting implications in the ethical world. So the, the story goes something like this. There apparently was a, a partnership between some students at Iowa State University and the University of Iowa. And they decided that they had a lot of free time on their hands because class was going well. And so these group of students, they decided to start making some counterfeit $20 bills. There's an ethical implication right there. <laughs> and they were doing well, and they were doing, and they got a little complacent in May. You know, even when you get in the unethical business, you got to be paying attention. 
So they they were they were doing well, and and they left the motor running one night on the machine, and they woke up the next morning, and lo and behold, they had a bunch of counterfeit eighteen dollar bills, and they thought, oh, uh -oh. we're in trouble. We produced all these, we got all it. Oh. Hey, isn't there that little university down there in the Cedar Falls, Waterloo area? They, they're not paying much attention. They don't pretty much know what's going on with the system. Why don't we go down there, and I think maybe we can get rid of these $18 bills. We'll just, we'll cash them in when they're not noticing and they're not paying attention. And so they went down, and lo and behold, they showed up at a, uh, at a conference at, at, a, at the student union, and there were some. Uh, there were a bunch of U and I students sitting around, and these folks from uh, uh, Iowa and Iowa State said, "Say, would you folks by any chance be able to cash in some eighteen-dollar bills?" So these young students from the University of Northern Iowa kind of smiled, went to a little conference, uh, called their friends at Allen College, called their friends at, at Hawkeye, and said, what do you guys think? And they came back with a decision. They said, sure, no problem, but we have one question. Folks from Iowa and Iowa State said, what's your question? They said, well, we're, your, we're curious. Would you like those cashed into two nines or three sixes? <laughs> so everybody gets engaged in the, the transaction of ethics. I'm happy to be here. My assignment was to talk about how we build ethical organizations, how we build a culture of ethics, what we do in higher ed, uh, how we're going about doing it. And I think the, the big implication in higher education, of course, came several years ago uh, with Sarbanes-Oxley. And Sarbanes-Oxley said, hey, financially, you really have to pay attention, you have to justify, you have to make sure A is going to B is going to C. And, you're spending the right dollars on the right things. So this is a, a, a letter that's on our website uh, from our ethics point information that allows anybody uh, to get in touch with us and say, hey, I think maybe something, something's going wrong. I don't think the, the money's being spent right. I don't think the dollars are being directed correctly. I don't think, uh, I don't think it makes sense to me what you're doing financially. And so I think the, the biggest thing that we know is that we're trying hard to get out there to let people either anonymously or, or with the name attached say to us, hey, can you explain this a little bit better? But I would tell you that uh, as, a, as a management professor, uh, ethics is much, much more than just financial. And I would argue to you that ethics is behavioral and there are issues behind ethical behavior. And I think, uh, as the consummate professor that I am, I think we can teach ethical behavior. I think we can change behavior that's not ethical and create behavior that is ethical. And I think there's some really, really simple principles that I'd like to share with you today in terms of how we can think about doing that and noticing rewarding sometimes the wrong behavior and why we reward the wrong behavior. Uh, simple definition, org behavior is the behavior of individuals, groups, and the structure surrounding them on the performance and effectiveness of an organization. So org behavior is not just the behavior of the individuals. It's the ultimate behavior of the groups. And then it's kind of that inanimate third object, kind of the mob behavior. It's, how does the organization operate as an entity? And notice the, the latest battle in Washington, D.C., which fortunately has been solved for another apparently, I don't know what, six months? Um, they keep putting deadlines on themselves. But notice the behavioral accusations. It's not necessarily Senator so-and-so or Representative so-and-so. It's the Republicans as a group and the Democrats as a group. And even now, I heard on the news this morning, it's not just the president, but it's the White House, okay, as a group. We're very good as human beings at pointing figures to other people, and it's exceptionally easy for us to point at groups of people, because then we don't have to identify anybody. So if it's the White House's fault, 
There's a whole slew of people working in the White House. If it's the Republicans' fault, that's Hawaii Republicans, Vermont Republicans, Florida Republicans, Iowa Republicans, whoever it is. Same with the Democrats, okay? So understand that as we look at organizational behavior, we're looking at three and potentially four levels of behavior. I believe that org behavior and org communication are drivers of ethical behavior, ethical performance, and ethical success in what we do for organizations. So my argument at the bottom is org behavior does lead to organizations that are ethical. Now, as a, as a scholar and a, and a professor in the area of management, I studied under folks at the University of Nebraska who were Skinnerian behaviorists. And I believe this for years, and that is very simply that behavior is and always has been a function of its consequences. One of the reasons why people get away with stuff is because there's never been a consequence. Now, I'm gonna see if I got any honesty in the room. Has anyone in here ever exceeded the speed limit in their automobile? <laughs> okay, keep those hands up. Those of you that have exceeded the speed limit, ha have anybody never gotten a ticket? Okay, and that is exactly why you will continue to exceed <laughs> the speed limit. Okay, that's more of a legal issue, but I would look at it as a behavioral issue. How many times have you gone to a restaurant and the meal you got was either not what you ordered, exactly what you ordered, but cold, hard, terrible tasting, whatever it is, and when your server came by and said very enthusiastically, how's it going? You quietly looked up and say, oh, good. <laughs> right? That server is sincerely looking for their organization to behaviorally change. And if you provide no feedback, it's not going to happen. We had a session the other night. Where I've, I've, I had a practice since I've been at Chibbensburg in here. And we had our first session the other night. Um, I like to go out to the students. So we had a session with about 100, 150 students over in Towers. Uh, and talked about the university, what's going on in safety, what's going on in class, what's going on in food service, what's going on in the living environment. And classically, a student got up and said, well, you know, I was in Rialto, that's our dining facility the other day, and my soup was cold. And of course, our director of food service says, did you say anything to anybody? Oh, no, I didn't want to bother anybody, <laughs> okay? So one of the things we need to help in terms of creating ethical organizations, we have to make it comfortable for people to provide feedback, feedback because their behavior is going to be a function of the consequence. And all too often, as we engage people in behavior, you know, we're a penalty society in general. We're not a half full glass of water society. We are a lot of don't, can't, won't. Again, think of driving an automobile. Is there a bright green sign on University Avenue that says with a big smiley face from the mayor, the governor, the chief of police, says, wow, thanks for driving 35 miles an hour. No, there's a sign that says speed limit 35. No right turn on red, okay? No stopping, no parking. Uh, there's a classic story, a legend out of the state of Florida where they had problems on I-75. Speed limit was too high, accident rate was too high. The governor issued a bunch of dollars for the state patrol in Georgia to stop people with certificates congratulating them for doing the speed limit. What happened? Average speed limit went down, average number of accidents went down, State of Georgia ran out of money and they stopped the program. <laughs> okay? So I, one of the big takeaways I'd like you to remind yourself, ethical behavior, non-ethical behavior, ultimately becomes a function of its consequences. And all too often, if we don't do something, say something, or model good behavior for people, we should not be surprised that we are not allowing things or behaviors to be gotten away with, if you will. Okay, 
Learning is a piece that we have to remember is critical for people to under, understand ethical behavior and people to be able to model, model ethical behavior and understand what good behavior looks like. Because the reality is, is all too often, we think we know what ethical behavior is, we think we know right and wrong, we think we know social norms and mores, but people haven't learned them. I use the example of faces and names. How many people in here are really, really good with faces but can't remember a name for the life of them, right? Well, there's a real easy explanation for that. And the easy explanation for that is the observational behavior is rewarded. So when you meet somebody, talk to somebody, interact with somebody, you're looking at them. But in general, when you talk with somebody, and especially you meet somebody for the first time, who says their name? They do, right? All right. The argument is, if you want to remember a name, when you interact with a person the first time, repeat their name five times. You will have a better chance of remembering the name. Where does that fit into learning? The answer, the reason you remember the face, you learned the face. The reason you don't remember the name is because you never learned the name. Okay? So again, as we're creating these cultures and organizations, let's sure we make, make sure we let people learn. And there's really four simple principles to learning. Learning is relatively permanent. That means it repeats over time. Uh, it's uh, the old story about riding a bicycle. Okay? Once you learn how to ride a bicycle, that behavior is relatively permanent in your mind. It may take a a little challenge, a couple falls, a little balance, but you can do it again. It's a change in behavior. So learning is something different from what happened before. So important as we teach ethical behavior. And we always see the examples out there in the corporate world of people making copies that are tax returns on the corporate copy machine, okay? And thinking that's okay because nobody ever said anything, all right? So what we have to do to do that is you have to relatively permanently change that behavior. How do you do that? You have to reinforce it. Best example I can give you of the challenge to reinforcing bad behavior and change it to good behavior. You have an employee that shows up at work always between 20 and 30 minutes after the hour of 8 o'clock. You sit down with that employee and you say, Mabel, Harry, Time starts 8 o'clock. you got to come in. All right? Two things we don't do, okay, that continue for that person to be confused. One is we don't come in till 20 or 30 minutes after the hour. All right? So Mabel or Harry's going, all right? And we don't show or recognize or reinforce Mabel or Harry for doing the good behavior. If you want them to do well or perform appropriately, the best way or one of the best ways to solve that problem, come in at quarter to eight, and when Mabel or Harry shows up before eight o'clock, congratulate, thank them, reward them for coming in before eight o'clock. And I'd be willing to bet you, you are on your road to changing that person's performance behavior. And then finally, it's got to be reinforced practice or experience. There's a whole bunch of people that don't know, don't get, don't understand what ethical behavior looks like. College and universities, 18 to 25 year olds, some of the most formative years and some of the most poor decision years in, in individuals' lives. And what we do or don't do is we don't allow them and we don't allow ourselves to help change or craft their behavior by reinforcing something. Simple things. Next time you're on campus and you see a student who obviously sees a visitor to our campus with the deer in the headlight looks, you know, <coughs> excuse me, you always see we on university campuses know <coughs> because we were there at one point in time. You see, you see this deer in the headlight look and somebody who's never been to campus and is obviously looking for a building that we've been to 5,000 times, and so we think nothing of it. <coughs> so next time you see a student with a visitor, helping that visitor find their way, take five seconds out of your time to say, hey, good job. 
That's what I mean by <coughs> learning ethical behavior. Now, how do you do that? Very simply, all my psychology friends, all my org behavior friends in the room will know this, but I think it's important to say this. In order to change behavior, you got to do things. You either apply or withhold positive or negative situations. If you apply a positive stimulus, you're going to positively reinforce somebody, behavior increases. The behavior you want increases, okay? And that's, that can be a thank you, that can be a self-report, it can be an email. Um, if you ever want to confuse, I, I, I'm famous for saying this, if you ever want to confuse your boss when you go back to work on Monday, go into your boss's office on Monday morning right before work starts, stick your head in the door and say, hey, thanks a million for all you do, and then leave. <laughs> they will follow you around for like two weeks. <laughs> what did I do? But that's positive reinforcement. Thanks a million. I tell students, if you really want to confuse your professor, next time you get a, an assignment that's due two weeks from now, turn it in a week early and then ask the professor if there's anything else you can do. <laughs> the professor will follow you around for a couple weeks and go, wow. But that's positive reinforcement. I think that's important. So as we see ethical and right behavior being done, we need to reward people for that. As we see ethical or wrong behavior being done, we need to be able to punish some kind of a negative uh, application of a stimulus that lets people know that's not the right thing to do, okay? It's not right to copy your tax returns on the corporate copy machine. It's not right to make a long distance phone call to your sister-in-law in Florida on the company phone, all right? And that gets to be a very sensitive environment, but we have to think about the myriad of ways we can do that. We have to be careful in the reward system. If we withhold a positive, we are going to extinguish behavior, and we have to be careful. That's a little bit of the baby with the bathwater. Uh, I think about it in the classroom environment. If you go to class and a student continually raises their hand and you do not call on that student, it's pretty easy to know what's going to happen with that behavior. I think the presumption is hand raising and questioning is good behavior in the college environment. You don't acknowledge that person. I see it a little bit in, in my ability to interact with students, faculty, staff, and the community. Many, many people, as you might expect, call me on the phone. Say, hey, can I just have, people just only want five minutes of my time, right? I know Gloria and I have had this conversation. She's a provost, so they want only 10 minutes of her time, right? But you want to be able not to shut people out if they have a good idea. I can't see everybody. But I have to figure out and I have to coordinate with all the staff and all the folks that work with us at the university, how do I get that person's five minutes of time to at least be heard? Otherwise, it may be inconsequential, it may be consequential, it may be intermediate, but nothing worse than shutting down somebody who wanted five minutes of your time because that person is going to tell 20 other people and those 20 other people are going to tell 20 other people, and the story's going to get really crazy about exactly why you didn't spend five minutes of your time. So be careful you don't extinguish the good behavior by not rewarding or withholding something that's positive. And then the other one that's always fascinating is sometimes we try and increase behavior by withholding a negative, okay? Um, you know, the old adage of, uh, we probably heard it as kids, you know, wait till your father gets home. Wait till your mother gets home. But little things like, you know, all parents and families try to improve behavior by, you know, if you say please and thank you, you're not going to have to set the dinner table tonight. Because a child may think that setting the dinner table is bad, bad news. So that's a way that you can negatively reinforce by withholding something, but you want to cause positive behavior to increase. The other thing that I notice, and I'll give you a couple examples, is, um, and this may sound crazy, but I think in the ethical world, we have to be very careful about what I call zero tolerance policies. And you hear it all the time. The one that just can't, I don't know if everybody saw the news this morning about the young man 
He's a Walmart employee. He was in the parking lot on a break. He saw a woman being assaulted. He went to his, her rescue, saved the day. And because that's against the policy at Walmart, he got fired. OK? And you kind of want to go, really? <laughs> you see all the time the five-year-old celebrated his five, fifth birthday last night got a one-inch prize, bright red, Swiss Army pocket knife. And for whatever reason, it showed up in his pocket at school the next day. And they boot him out of school for a week. And you kind of just want to say, and the answer is always, that's our policy. So I'm a big believer in punishment fitting the crime. I'm a big believer in... Um, and in the five months I've been here, I can probably think of maybe 10 times Gloria and I have had this kind of conversation about what's the right thing to do with that student, that faculty member, that community member, whatever it is. And I think you have to adjust. I think you have, a, have to adjust to the world. And I can give you two examples from the higher education environment that, that I believe, at least in my history, created different behavior. When I was at the University of Toledo, we had a policy, zero tolerance. If you pulled the fire alarm in the residence halls, you got booted out of school, period, okay? No ifs, no ands, no, no note from dad, no questions from mom, no, no cookies from grandpa, you're out, all right? Well, what we discovered is the incidences of fire alarm polling kind of continued because what we'd forgotten about in our wonderful zero tolerance policy was the addendum to the kicking out for one year is once you're out for one year, you can reapply to get back in, okay? So there really wasn't a huge long-term terrible policy that you went out, you left, you behaved yourself, you came back, you got back in. So we did a little small tweak to our pulling the fire alarm policy, and the new fire alarm policy was you get caught pulling a fire alarm and you will serve 60 volunteer hours at the burn ward at the hospital. The incidences of fire alarm polling went to zero because we believed the punishment and understanding of what they were doing fit the crime, all right? People were all of a sudden saying, oh, that's what fire alarms are for. They're not for fun. They're to get me out of the building so I don't end up on the burn ward at the hospital. Second incident I had when I was at Boise State, we had a, uh, a uh, fraternity that was having a great time, and they decided to go to the construction site next to their fraternity house and borrow a sufficient amount of wood to build their homecoming bonfire so that they could cook hot dogs and s'mores and other things for their alumni, their friends, their neighbors, uh, the sorority across the street, and they got caught. And the construction, the owner came into my office and demanded, I want the fraternity disbanded, I want these kids kicked out of school. And we said, okay, sir, but tell us why it was so easy for these kids to go to your construction site and get wood to start their fire with. And he very sheepishly said, oh, I'm over budget and past due and I don't have enough money for security guards so I have to leave this stuff out all night. So that's why they were able to get it. So the solution we came up with again, which we felt caused thought and caused ethical behavior, is number one, financially, the wood was replaced by the fraternity. What's the value of what was taken? You replace it. And then not as the group that stole, but as an entire fraternity, their new assignment until completion of the construction project was they are now the new security force for that construction project to make sure others didn't show up. And what you got out of that was a whole group of young men that started thinking, oh, that's what ethical behavior looks like. And of course, the good news for us, 
we didn't have to dramatically tell the story like they did because every fraternity, every sorority, every student group on campus knew that, what are you guys doing hanging out at the construction site all night long? Well, here's kind of the story, all right? And here's how it goes. So those are the stories I think about that as we, as we create uh, ethical organizations, we create examples, we give people, you gotta give some people some second chances. You gotta give some people a chance, especially ones you really believe don't know that that was an unethical kind of behavior because they don't have all the variables. You gotta give them a chance to behave correctly. And as a good friend of mine always said, and you've seen this a lot before, you always gotta do the right thing even when nobody's looking. Even when nobody's paying attention, even when the, you're the last one out of the room and you shut off the lights because you know energy's important. You're the last one out of the building and you lock the door because you know safety's important. You do those things that when you look in the mirror, you feel good that I did the right thing. I went out of my way. You know, I picked up, I don't know if you saw in the Des Moines Register about the fabulous lady, mother of four, um, working, I think, two jobs, found an ISU student's wallet on the, the off-ramp of the interstate, okay? Didn't have much money in it, didn't have really a credit card or two in it, had his student ID in it, got a hold of the young man, or got a hold of the university and said, I got a wallet, can I mail this back, can you give me an address? And mailed it back, wrote a very nice note about the world and doing the right thing and pay it forward, and she put a $10 bill in the wallet, okay? Now the hope can only be is that's gonna cause ethical, better, pay it forward behavior. Within a university like the University of Northern Iowa or Hawkeye or Allen or ISU or, or U of I, it's, it's daily. It's daily the kind of things we try to do to thank people. You know, I have encouraged everybody this year to find a building on campus they haven't been to Go to that building, find somebody you haven't met or don't know or haven't seen for a while, introduce yourself, remind them what you do, and, hey, and thank them for all they do for the institution. That's going to cause, I hope, more open communication, more good behavior, more ethical behavior. You have to develop norms and roles that model ethical behavior, and you have to be able to be willing to do it not only through discussion and dialogue and agreement, but also disagreement. I think the challenge is, and I want to kind of learn it from what's happened in the last 17 days in Washington, D.C., there's a lot of stuff I don't agree with. But you know what? By golly, as the president of this university, I think there are just sometimes it's my obligation to sit people down and talk about it, okay? It's not the dean's job. It's not the provost's job. It's not the student's job. They gave you a title called president, and sometimes when you're president, you stop what you're doing, and you sit down and talk about things. You may not get to an agreement. You may sit there and go, uh, you're full of nuts, you know? But the thing is, is if you want ethical behavior, you gotta dialogue, you gotta discuss, you gotta agree, you gotta disagree, and then you gotta example. You gotta model example out there, because there's just a ton of people that don't know, or don't see, or don't think, that what you do is similar to what I do, okay? I can only imagine those of us that have been out of school for a few years, now that I listen to the current music of the day, what, my, what, I, what I must have been thinking when I played the Beatles or the Stones on my radio at 11 on a 10 scale, um, and maybe didn't respect what they were thinking about as they listened to Frank Sinatra and, and other things, and now I discover that I'm, <laughs> I am my parents. We just had a reception over at the house last night, and the two of the CDs that were on the CD were Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin. <laughs> so I think the issue becomes is we get kids from all over. We get faculty from all over. We get international folks. Models and roles of behavior internationally are very different from what they are in the United States. Ethics and norms and roles are very different from what they are in the United States. I mean, the College of Business, I know, has wonderful conversations about what are payments for things done in the United States that aren't bribery? And what are payments for things done outside the United States that we want to think are bribery, but they believe are the norms 
of getting business done in their country. So I think those five things are very important. Discussion, dialogue, agreement, disagreement, and then example. The, the final takeaway I guess I would give you is make sure people know what, not just what ethics means, what right and wrong means, but what good behavior means. What does it look like? What does it look like to me as a human being to behave ethically? And again, the classic argument would be, a picture's worth a thousand words. A picture is absolutely worth a thousand words. And then finally, we work hard in five areas at the University of Northern Iowa to make sure that ethics are, are an issue, ethics are on the top of our, our list uh, in scholarship, in dealing with students, and, and one of the great things about you and I is the interaction and interface between our faculty and our students is that they really, and if you, I've been to a couple classes where they're getting into it, and that's a good thing. Among colleagues, among academic colleagues and among non-academic colleagues, it's important to model ethical behavior. As the university, and then as the university as a good steward within the community, how do we make sure in the university, as a university entity, that individually, in groups, and as an institution, we are modeling ethical behavior, supporting our community, partnering with our sister higher education universities, and really out there engaging and making things happen. So as you can see from my perspective, I'm a big believer in ethical organizations, but at the root cause, I, I want to challenge you, start looking at behavior. Start looking at behavior that's good. Start looking at behavior that can be improved. What are some of the things we can do to change that behavior? How can we do it to go forward? One of the ethical challenges is halfway to the wall, all right? If you really think about how I'm gonna change behavior, it's always halfway to the wall. The likelihood of you getting there pretty much approaches zero, but you're always gonna get halfway to the wall. And in the spirit of my first story, I'll leave you with another ethics story that you can go home with. And that is solely out of a young student from the University of Northern Iowa who was a great fisherman. And he went up north. He went across the line into Minnesota because he heard there were 10,000 lakes in Minnesota. So he figured he had a better, he was not sure how many lakes there were in Iowa, but he figured he had a better shot in Minnesota. So he went up to Minnesota and he found himself this beautiful lake and he came into the, the dining established every evening with two or three stringers of fish and nobody else had any fish. And one night he ran into the game warden and the warden said, say, it appears as though you're doing pretty well. Nobody else is doing very well. Can I go fishing with you? Kid from you and I said, no problem, warden. 5 a.m. at the dock, meet me there, we'll go fishing. So next morning, 5 o'clock, the warden shows up, and the classic warden is, you know, he's got his rubber boots on and eight fishing poles and the hat and the lures and the bait. And Here's this kid from the University of Northern Iowa. He's got himself a burlap bag and another burlap bag over his back, and he's smoking himself a cigar. He says, warden, let's go fishing. So they jump in a little john boat. They go out about a quarter mile in the lake. Kid from you and I puffs on that cigar, reaches in the first burlap bag, and pulls out a stick of dynamite. <laughs> he lights that stick of dynamite, boy, and he throws that into the water. Well, as you imagine, the warden's going bananas, right? He says, sir, he says, you do not understand. I am a duly authorized deputized member of the Minnesota law enforcement community, and I can bring the full force and weight of the law upon you. About that time, the dynamite goes off. About four or five seconds later, all these fish come floating up to the surface. Guy pulls out the other burlap bag, starts loading up the fish. Well, the warden, by this time, he's got every certificate, every license, every document, every badge that he could find. And he says, sir, he says, I am duly deputized, authorized by the law enforcement community of the state of Minnesota to bring the full force and the weight of law down upon you. Kid from you and I stops, reaches back into the first burlap bag, puffs on the cigar, pulls out another stick of dynamite, throws the dynamite onto the warden's lap, <laughs> smiles. He says, warden, are we going to fish or are we going to talk? 
Two stories you can take home. Behavior is very important. I thank you very much for enjoying us today in a very, very important discussion about ethics, about behavioral ethics, about organizational behavior, and creating a culture in our organizations that is ethical, honest, upfront, and behavior that we can be proud of. Thank you so much. I appreciate having the opportunity to speak with you this morning.